When I was a kid, the first thing I learned to cook was instant oatmeal with my grandpa. He'd pull the box out of the cupboard, present the choices, peaches and cream all the way, never raisins and spice. He'd let me tear open the packet, measure the water, give it a stir, and count down as it cooked in the microwave. Making my own breakfast with grandpa gave my kid self a sense of independence. But were my instant oats actually healthy? These days there are so many oatmeal options available. Steel cut, old fashioned, instant, flavored. Choosing what to buy can be overwhelming. When it comes to health, are all oats created equal? Let's science it. Hey, welcome to Nourishville, I'm Dr. Lara. When dissecting oatmeal, we need to consider the processing and the flavoring. But first, we need to define what we mean by healthy. And there's a few different ways of looking at it. One perspective is the nutrient content. Let's compare the Nutrition Facts panel on Steel Cut, Old Fashioned, Instant, and my childhood favorite, Instant Peaches and Cream. When adjusted for equal serving sizes, they're pretty similar for protein, fat, and total carbs. The unflavored varieties all have 4 grams of dietary fiber, and that's a pretty good amount of fiber, providing 14% of your daily needs. Specifically, oats are a good source of a soluble fiber called beta-glucan. Here I have some powdered beta-glucan. When you eat oats, the beta-glucan dissolves in water within the intestine, swells up, and forms a gel. This gel makes it more difficult to reabsorb bile acids from the intestine back into the body. This means your liver can't recycle those bile acids, and instead has to make them from scratch using cholesterol, which ultimately helps reduce your bad LDL cholesterol. That's the mechanism underlying the FDA-approved health claim on oatmeal. So all oatmeal is a good source of soluble fiber. That's a plus. There's one thing that really stands out. The added sugar in the peaches and cream oatmeal. Over 9 grams in a serving. Daily added sugar intake is recommended to be capped at 10% of daily calories. So assuming a 2000 calorie diet, one serving contributes about a fifth of that added sugar cap. Whether that amount of added sugar is a concern really depends on the rest of your dietary pattern and how much added sugar you get throughout the day. But based on nutrient content alone, my childhood favorite is knocked down a few notches. But the unflavored forms of oatmeal are pretty equivalent. Another perspective is the impact on blood glucose. This is called the postprandial glycemic response. Prandial meaning eating, post meaning after, glycemia referring to blood glucose. So looking at what happens to the blood glucose response after eating oatmeal. Frequent spikes in blood glucose increase inflammation, and over time this drives the development of chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes. Slow, gradual rises are the aim of the blood glucose game. Why would we expect different postprandial glycemic responses? Even though they're all the same ingredients, just oats, they differ in their processing, and this may influence our digestion. All oatmeal starts as oat groats. An oat groat is a whole grain in all its glory, a fibrous bran coat surrounding a starchy endosperm and inner germ. That outer bran is a dense network of different kinds of fibers, slowing our enzymes from accessing the starch in the endosperm. Steel cut oats take the oat groats and cut them up in coarse pieces. This coarse cutting mostly maintains the integrity of the oat kernel. Old fashioned oats are steamed and then flattened through rollers. The rolling disrupts the fibrous bran and the steaming relaxes the starch, making it more accessible to digestive enzymes. Instant oats are similar, except they're rolled thinner and steamed longer. All this processing impacts how quickly they can be cooked, but also how readily the carbohydrates are accessible for digestion and absorption into the blood. I wanted to find out for myself whether my glucose responded differently to steel cut, old fashioned, or instant oats, so I designed a little N of 1 experiment. Based on the processing, I'm predicting that I'll get the fastest and highest spike in blood glucose with the instant oats, the lowest and slowest with the steel cut, and that the old fashioned will fall somewhere in between. Though I don't think the instant oats will have a huge spike due to that beta glucan fiber. The viscous gel that forms in the stomach slows down gastric emptying, so the meal is more slowly released into the intestines where the digestive enzymes live. Plus, the gel in the intestine slows down the absorption of 
glucose. I'm getting ready for the first day of my three-day experiment, and I've decided to reduce other factors that would impact my blood glucose response. So I have fasted for 12 hours, I haven't had any alcohol in the past 24 hours, and I haven't had any physical activity this morning. Elliot is perturbed about missing his morning walk. Hmm. I'm using a continuous glucose monitor, which measures my blood glucose every five minutes. And today I'm eating one cup of steel-cut oats cooked in the Instapot. And now I'm gonna sit tight for the next two hours and let my blood glucose do its thing. Good morning, it's day two, and I'm getting ready to eat one cup of old-fashioned oats cooked on the stovetop. Elliot is crankier about missing his morning walk again. It's day three, and again, I have to skip my morning walk. Huh? <sighs> uh, today, I'm eating one cup of instant oats cooked in the microwave. So let's take a look at my data. In blue, this is my blood glucose response to the steel cut oats over two hours. It looks like it peaks to 142 milligrams per deciliter at 40 minutes, and then normalizes back to baseline after an hour and a half, even plateauing a bit lower than my fasting blood glucose in the morning. In red here, we have the old fashioned oatmeal. It looks like it peaks later and lower, only up to 130 at 50 minutes, then back to baseline around 80 minutes, with this weird little rise at the end. And finally, in yellow is the instant oatmeal. It peaks around the same time as the steel cut, but a little bit higher, up to 147, and then lowers but never goes all the way back down to baseline. I have to say this isn't what I was expecting. I really thought that I would see really huge differences between the instant and the steel cut oats, but they actually look pretty similar to each other. And then the best blood glucose response seems to be to the, uh, to the old fashioned oats, which has kind of the lowest and slowest rise. But when I do a hacked glycemic index calculation comparing the area under the curve of my blood glucose response from a sugar drink to the oatmeals, steel cut raises my blood glucose only 39% as much, old-fashioned 45% and instant 63%. So that measure falls in line with my hypothesis. Clearly, we can't make strong conclusions from my little n of 1 experiment. There have been lots of studies comparing the glycemic response of various kinds of oats to refined grains like white bread, so a bit different than my oatmeal head-to-head. -head. Meta-analyses that analyze many studies together concluded that the greater the processing, the higher the glycemic response. The least processed steel cut oats had the lowest and slowest rise in blood glucose, followed by old fashioned, and then instant had the highest response, on average classifying instant oats as a high glycemic index food. The consensus in the research literature is that steel cut oats are the best choice for those low and slow glycemic responses. I wonder if cooking my steel cut oats in the Instapot influenced how quickly I could digest and absorb the carbs, which may account for the difference in my little experiment. The other thing to consider is that all of these studies were looking at oatmeal in isolation, aka boring oatmeal. In the real world, oatmeal is usually eaten with toppings like fruits, nuts, and seeds, which contribute fiber, protein, and fat that likely influence the glycemic response. Finally, another perspective is the impact on satiety. Satiety is a sense of fullness after eating, and how that fullness persists until the next time you eat. Meals that maintain satiety for longer help prevent overeating. It's the beta-glucan fiber that seems to be important here again. When beta-glucan forms a gel in the stomach, it activates stretch receptors that signal fullness to the brain, slows down gastric emptying, and increases release of satiety-inducing hormones. There have been some really creative studies looking at the satiating impact of oatmeal. Researchers recruited a group of volunteers to come to the lab on two separate days. One day they fed them oatmeal, and on the other day they fed them a ready-to-eat cereal like Cheerios. Hunger and fullness was assessed before breakfast and for four hours after breakfast. 
Then they were provided with a huge lunch spread and told they could eat until satisfied. Eating instant, old-fashioned, or steel-cut oatmeal all suppressed hunger and maintained greater fullness than the cereal. Plus, oatmeal breakfasts led to eating less at lunch. I only found one study that put instant oats head-to-head -head with old-fashioned, and overall they were pretty equivalent for satiety. When it comes to oatmeal, all levels of processing make for a more satiating breakfast than ready-to-eat cereals, which can help reduce between-meal hunger gremlins and prevent overeating at lunch. Here are my nourishable takeaways. Regardless of processing, all unflavored oatmeals are pretty equal in terms of nutrients and satiety. From the glycemic perspective, steel-cut oats are the healthiest, though my personal data seemed a little wonky. If you're looking to avoid spikes in blood glucose as much as possible, then steel-cut is the way to go. But I wouldn't say that old-fashioned or instant oats are unhealthy, because glycemic responses are only one piece of the puzzle. The reality is that the time investment involved in making steel-cut oats isn't always feasible, and these other more processed oats still have many health benefits. They're all nutrient-dense, with fiber, vitamins, and minerals, and that beta-glucan in particular plays roles in inducing satiety, reducing cholesterol absorption, and nourishing the microbiome. Studies show that people who eat oatmeal of any kind have higher diet quality scores and healthier anthropometrics, like BMI and waist circumference. All types of oatmeal offer a nutrient-dense canvas to add other nutrient-dense toppings like fruit, nuts, and seeds. I've been experimenting with savory oatmeal and love adding kimchi topped with a hard-boiled egg. Side note from this edition of Eat the Props, I had never tried oat groats before, but they're delicious. They're super nutty and super chewy. They make a really great base as a pilaf, as well as a nice whole grain topping on salads. And since they're minimally processed, they maintain most of their natural food matrix. If I could go back in time now, I'd probably ask my grandpa to shift to unflavored instant oats to avoid that added sugar, and then let me pick from various fruit, nut, and seed toppings for flavorings. But understand this. All unflavored oatmeal processing options have benefits. When time permits, go for steel cut. But when it doesn't, reaching for old-fashioned or instant are great nutrient-dense options. That's what science tastes like. Thanks for tuning in to Nourishable. Check out all my references in the video description, and be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all things nutrition.